start. Let's. Uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to Books and Beyond, which is a central library um, books uh, book club, daytime book club. And uh, today's program actually is part of uh, what we called 901 Personal Finance. It started as a committee. Ernest is the leader of the committee, and he is a brand, uh, He is a librarian at the Crenshaw Branch Library who is passionate about personal finance. And we started in the spring called Money Smart 2021, and then we branded into 901 Personal Finance. And uh, now, because it's, it was so successful, we started this Oktoberfest, and we created uh, the committee created a list of uh, about eight. Uh, programs uh, targeting about personal finance and today's book and author Mandy's book is also one of these eight programs trying to empower our community with important personal finance topics and information and uh, from credit repair to home ownership to um, Social Security and Medicare and all these wonderful information that we all want to learn about it. And you can actually find more information about this 901 Personal Finance Oktoberfest on our library's website, memphislibrary.org. You click on the 901 Personal Finance Oktoberfest and you will see a list of all these programs. Today's programs from Yesterday actually was the first program and today we have the author's book talk and uh, we will it will last these two weeks this week and next week and the last program will be on um, October the 30th and you will see a list of all these wonderful programs. Um, so uh, today um, I, I can see Ernest is joining us today. Let's welcome Ernest first. He's a librarian at a Crenshaw Branch Library who is passionate about personal finance topics and he led our committee and uh, he was a salesman himself in his earlier career and uh, he will be the host and the moderator of today's book talk. So let's welcome Ernest first. Ernest, are you available to, are you ready? <coughs> Ernest, you're muted. OK, while Ernest is trying to fix his uh, um, technical problem, so let me just go ahead and introduce our speaker for today. Mandy, let me see if I can pronounce your name or last name correctly. Graziano? Graziano, you got Graziano. it. Graziano. Mm -hmm. um, um, Mandy's long and storied career include leadership roles in sales and operation positions with major hotel chains, independent hotels and private event venues across the United States. He has been a, she has been a sales manager, event manager, marketing manager, accounting account director, national sales manager, vice president of global accounts, entrepreneur, public speaker and a coach. What a stellar resume. Since 2007, she has run her own sales and a business coaching company, which helps sales teams, business leaders, and entrepreneurs improve their strategies for cultivating prospects, building stronger business relationships, and closing deals. Since 2010, she's been the vice president of global accounts at HPN Global, an international site selection venue, finding meetings and a plan. Funding and a meeting planning company where she finds hotels and venues for her clients all over the world, negotiates prices and contracts, and providing consulting all, uh, on all aspects of managing meetings, conferences, and conventions around the world. So you can learn more about by visiting Mandy grizanos.com uh, that her website so may let's welcome mendy our author of the book sales tales and uh, the hustle humor and lessons from a from a life in sales mendy the floor is yours hello well thank you for having me and hello everybody it's great to see you 
Um, and it was really nice to talk with you and Ernest the other day. Um, as I understand it, I think Ernest has read most of the book, um, but here is the book. It's Sales Tales, pretty great cover. My favorite is the red tennis shoes that are on the, that are on the cover of the book. And um, this book, you know, I've been writing for so long since I was a little girl and I never thought I would write a business book. I always thought I would write a fiction book and I ended up writing a business book. And uh, the way the business book came to be was I hired a writing coach and I have journals, duffel bags, boxes of journals that I have been writing in since I was a little girl. And I've always made observations of people. And I really believed that I would make a fiction book with all these great characters that I had met over the years. And instead, when I hired the coach, she had me do some writing for her. And she said, hey, can you write a business book? And I said, oh, man, I, I'm living and breathing this all day long. Do you really want me to do that? And she said, the tone of your voice changes. And it feels just so much more entertaining when you write about business. I can feel your voice and the passion coming through in the writing. So I said, sure, on one condition. It has to be fun. Everything in our world right now is so intense. And so I wanted it to be fun and light. And I wanted it to be relatable. So not just for people in business, but I think about my mom who is a mother of four um, kids and now a grandma to many kids. And I think about the sales and negotiations she had to do just to get four of us awake and fed and out the door by 8 a.m. every day. And so I really wrote it with that tone was to disarm the stigma of sales and to help people realize that sales is for all of us, whether you're a mom or dad trying to put your kids to bed or whether you are trying to get a new job or whether you are trying to convince an insurance or a medical provider that they should pay for a service or a medical procedure that they didn't want to pay for. Because there's um, in the book, I talk a little bit about my husband's chronic illness and all of the insurance people that I had to talk to and all the medical people I had to talk to and just the general sales that go with that. So Sales Tales really is a book that I wrote for all of us. If you are a business person and an entrepreneur, you're going to get a little nugget from it. And if you are just somebody that is just interested in just business adjacent lessons, or if you have to convince somebody. Got another idea. Um, then, uh, then this book's for you too. So that's the origin of the book. And the book really goes through the sales process from start to finish. So I tell really funny stories about prospecting, um, like how I watched a reality TV show and took a name off the show and hunted that person down and turned her into a client. Um, that was from the million dollar uh, matchmaker. And um, we talk about networking, like when I was in San Francisco and I chased the Olympic torch with a whole bunch of people and ended up having a great story to talk about with clients at a client event that night and how networking can be fun. It doesn't have to be boring. Um, we talk about building relationships and how some relationships take time. Um, the people that you meet today, um, you're in it for the long haul and it's not transactional and to build upon relationships and really fun stories in that. Um, and then I also chat about time management, how time is our greatest asset. And with time management, there's toxic time. How are you spending your time? And then there's efficient time as well. So I talk a lot about you know, the things that I had to do um, when I managed my own personal illness and my husband's personal illness the amount of things I had to get done in a day and how I stayed laser focused and somehow managed my business through all of that. And there's some funny and endearing stories too. I just, I got an email from somebody earlier today who said, I just got your book yesterday. I'm already on page 114 and I laughed so hard, but I also cried. And I know she probably cried in chapter five, which is the time is your greatest asset chapter. I talk a little bit about some of my husband's and my personal health struggles, but we, we came through it. We warrior through it. And um, so the book itself was done. I started writing it 2017 
and I ended in December 2019. And then I started looking for publishers and agents at the beginning of 2020. Well, then COVID happened. And I think we all know what happened with COVID. Our world just sort of stopped. And I stopped looking for a publisher. And my business in the conference business, I had 162 contracts that I had to cancel and move to future years. We call it the lift and shift. So I was really busy doing that all of 2020. But as I went through 2020, I realized, huh, I think I've got another chapter in me. I think COVID is giving me the disaster selling chapter. So I added on the disaster selling chapter at the last minute. And then as I went through COVID, I realized, you know what? This is awful. But we've been here before. We were here in 2008 during the auto crisis. We were here in September um, 2001. And we were here in 1999. So I hearkened back to those experiences and found some common denominators of how to grow your business and thrive in your business through a disaster. And that's how the disaster selling chapter came to be. Um, and then that was the end of 2020. And then the beginning of 2020, I started my search for a publisher and an agent and all that good stuff again. And uh, we started we started the publishing and editing process April 2021. And tomorrow, October 20th, is the actual book launch. So you, we're talking today before the book's even launched. Now, it is available on Amazon, on Target, on Barnes & Noble, all these places online. So you can get it now. Um, but tomorrow, for the actual book launch, anybody that buys a book on October 20th, a portion of the proceeds are going to go to Junior Achievement San Diego, which is an organization I have volunteered for for years. And I've been in the classrooms talking to kids as ages six to 16 about personal finance and selling, marketing, starting a business and running a business. Um, and I really, really wanted to give back to that organization. So a portion of the proceeds from any online sales tomorrow go to Junior Achievement San Diego. And then tomorrow night is my book launch. And we're doing it a rooftop in a, of a hotel. Um, I live in San Diego. So please, fingers crossed that it doesn't rain or drizzle. Um, and it's a full moon tomorrow night. So the sky should be beautiful. But that's my journey with Sales Tales. And it really, there really is something in it for everyone. And I really, truly believe that sales is for everyone. Um, disarming the stigma of sales is really, really important to me. And helping people get comfortable with that notion of sales is really important. Does anyone have any questions? Nandy, I think Ernest is in the meeting now. Finally, that's great. But I do have, I have not read the book. Ernest has read the book, so he may ask more relevant and intelligent questions. Um, but what I want to say is that you are a veteran in, in sales business. So in this book, for those people like me have not read the book yet, can you share like your top three um, um, top three lessons that you learned in sales world that you can share with us and 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 your wisdom to to share with us. Absolutely. Um, I think number one is keep your antenna up. There is business everywhere. Some of the best business I've ever gotten is from eavesdropping on conversations. And, you know, there's a story in the book about my mom who she was just getting her tires changed and she was sitting in a waiting room and she's, she's an eavesdropper too. Look, look where I learned it from. But my mom is retired and she knows what my mission is. And she's such a great mom. She cares so deeply about all of her kids and her grandkids. So she's just getting her tires changed in the lobby of the tire place. And she overhears somebody talking about a convention and how they didn't really like the hotel they were at. And my mom asks, she engages with them and asks them, oh, what's the name of the convention? And then my mom just sends me a text message and says, the people at this convention didn't like their hotel, go. And so I go online and I find the name of the convention. I find the organizer of that convention. And I call that person. I say, hey, 
where are you going for your convention in the future? And how can I help you find a hotel that really, really matters to you? So that's just an example of keeping your antennas up and that business is everywhere. So I think that's my, you know, one of my first lessons. And I think another really good lesson for me is that you don't have to be boring when you network, you know, networking can happen in many shapes and sizes and networking doesn't always have to be a happy hour where you drink seven glasses of wine and you're the drunkest person at the business function that it doesn't have to happen that way. Although I do have a story in the book about a networking event that went awry when I had a little too much to drink in my early twenties. So make sure you read that. Cause that's an interesting, that's an interesting story. But I talk a little bit about sweat working um, how sometimes I'll do an exercise class with a client or with a partner, and that's how we build relationships. Or we'll take a walk, and that's how we build relationships. Or we have a common interest, you know, we, we do different things together. So I think the second lesson for me is that networking and building relationships with people, and it doesn't necessarily have to be in business, you know, it, it can be with family, it can be with friends, just find a common denominator, you know, whether it's pickleball I just started playing pickleball and there's a whole world of people that are playing pickleball right now that I now have something in common with so get a pickleball game together or you know maybe um you're an only child and you know you meet a neighbor with it that's an only child you know there's a common denominator there so um networking can be fun and it doesn't always have to surround around a happy hour I think that's the second lesson and I think the third lesson is business bedside manner. And I love this term so much that I trademarked it. Um, you'll see it. It's in the disaster selling section of the book, which is the last chapter. And business bedside manner really is an approach to how you interact with people. And the reality is, is ever since COVID, we've all changed. Our lives have changed. You know, many of us have lost people we really care deeply. I know I lost my godmother during COVID and that hit me really hard. It changed me. And my business went through so much turmoil that changed me. My clients and my people in my sphere, they're going through the same thing. So we can't do business the way we did it before. We really have to think through what approach we have to business. And we don't want to be that doctor that rushes you through an appointment, right? That's just really bad bedside matter. You don't feel like people are talking to you. You don't feel like you're heard in that situation. So I really love to encourage people to, if you don't have a business bedside manner, get one, define one. And if you think you do have a business bedside manner, it's probably time to redefine it, to reinvigorate your business bedside manner. And think about what your approach is. So, for example, prior to COVID, I used to just say, hey, happy Thursday. How are you doing today? Well, during COVID, I realized, listen, we, we all know how we're doing. We're tired. We're making sourdough bread. We're binge watching the Queen's Gambit. We, we know how we're doing. So instead, I switched it instead of how are you doing to what made you laugh today or what made you laugh this week? And that helped gain a deeper relationship with the person on the other end. And it also addressed that, I know what you're going through. You know what I'm going through. Let's talk about something fun and let's build a relationship that way. Um, another business bedside manner approach is just asking people and really going for the question, you know, what, what changed you during COVID and how are you different today? And what, what are you struggling with and what excites you? Um, and so these, the business bedside manner is, is important and it's your general approach to things. You know, are you empathetic? Are you kind? Do you know that when you go to a restaurant right now, things are just going to take a little bit longer. They just are. Restaurants are short staffed. Systems are weird. The supply chain is low and things are just going to take longer. So a part of your personal brand of business bedside manner is how patient are you? And I know patience is truly a virtue, but if you really think of your personal brand and your personal business bedside manner, how are you adjusting it to match what's really going on in the world right now today as the world changes so rapidly every day? So for me, I feel like those are the three biggest lessons that keep your antenna up, businesses everywhere, 
networking doesn't have to be about happy hour. Just find a common denominator and then business bedside manner. How does that help? Wonderful, wonderful lesson. Great wisdom. That's definitely we can learn something about it. And uh, talking about um, uh, dealing with change, dealing with uh, uh, um, COVID, that the, what COVID has impacted to all of us in many different ways. Um, so um, I would say that I, when I talked to you last week and uh, you are in the hotel business and uh, for us in the library, uh, when COVID hits, we cannot do any in-person program, we have to pivot quickly to do virtual program. And over a year, we're still, you can see, um, there are always silver lining and there were always difficulties. Um, we have technical difficulties every time we have to deal with the unknown and uh, we have just to um, manage, you know, things that we've never have to dealt with before. While in the same time, they're always silver lining too. Uh, we don't have to get out of the house. We can jump in and out of a virtual program anywhere with you in San Diego. And we have authors can speak with us across the country instead of just local author. So there are pluses and minuses and all these. But I would like to hear from you. How do you deal with these um, changes? How do you make the best out of these uh, situations? It's an awesome question. And I think resilience is really important, right? Um, the, the, the really big concept for myself that I did all through COVID and I still do right now is to remember that there's a whole bunch of things we can't control. Most things we can't control. But the one thing I can control is my mindset and how I react to situations. And so I'll give you an example. You know, my launch party is tomorrow. And there's a whole series of things that are happening by the day for a three hour party that should be pretty easy. And it's a, it's a bit of a mess, you know, and it's there's nothing I can control. Right. I can't control the wind. I can't control if my banner's going to blow away. I can't control that I need sandbags and the rec center gave me sandbags, but they didn't put sand in it. So my husband had to go out and get rocks and we put rocks in it. Like, I'm an entrepreneur running businesses. I didn't think I'd spend my Sunday sweating in my garage, pouring rocks in a sandbag, but I did, right? And I could have looked at that as, oh, painful, and I can't believe I have to do this. But I looked at it as, you know what? I'm launching a book. I'm making my dreams come true. Filling these sandbags with rocks, this is just a part of the process, and it's definitely going to make a good story. So I think, you know, really is being as positive as you can, but also being real about your mindset and just realizing just wave the white flag surrender to the lack of control of everything around us and you know try and find the good in it so you know that's one way um, I, and i think from a business standpoint i really tried to be a student of the crisis you know in my world i have meetings and conferences that i booked all over the world so i started hearing about covid in february 2020 and I originally thought, oh, that's just overseas. That's not that's not something that's happening in the United States. Well, then, you know, early March, my phone started ringing and people started canceling conferences. And so I had to be aware of the gathering guidelines of every city, state, county, country of where those meetings were. And I had to serve as an advisor to my customers. And that was really hard. I had a lot of sleepless nights where... I was reading the CDC website. I was reading the Department of Health and Human Services in each of these cities, states, counties, countries to try and understand what they could do. And I think through all that process, just really being a student of the crisis and gathering as much relevant data as I possibly could to give to my clients. So I was really valuable to them. So I think between maintaining a positive attitude and just being a humble student of the crisis, those are the two things that I really did during COVID. And I, I, I take those practices um, with me along the way. And you know, one, one thing I did do, which you might find interesting, is I had a customer who did a large meeting for 300 people in Las Vegas in September 2020. And at that point, a lot of people had not gathered and people had wondered, what, what does it look like? How does, it, how does registration look? And how are people serving food and beverage at these large conferences? 
So I flew out to Las Vegas and I took 43 10 to 20 second videos. I did a whole journey of what it's like to leave my house, go to the airport, get on an airplane, go to the hotel, go to the Las Vegas Strip, check in at the hotel, see what the hotel amenities were and how they were protecting you from COVID and keeping the hotel clean. And then how this meeting was run. And so I actually, I have it on my um, YouTube channel, which is uh, Mandy's Excellent Site Inspection Adventures. If you're ever interested in just looking at just cool hotels around the world, there are just tons of videos on that website, on that YouTube channel. But taking that, those videos really helped me chronicle what things looked like at that time. And then when I got back, I was able to have some phone calls with some of my potential customers and my current customers and share with them, hey, here's what's happening in the world. If you leave your house to go to the airport, here's what you can expect. If you get on an airplane, here's what you can expect. If you go to a hotel, here's what you can expect. And so by delivering some of that data to people and educating them on what it feels like and looks like to travel right now, it actually disarmed the nerve and the fear of being able to travel and help people understand, you know what, I could do this. Um, it's going to look different than the way it was before. It's going to take a little more time than the way it did before, but it can be done. So I just try to continue to educate people on the process. And if you go to my website, you'll see on my blogs, um, if you click on, on the blogs where it says um, the, uh, for the love of meetings, I've been chronicling what it feels like and looks like to travel all throughout COVID. And so you can actually see that as well. Because I really want people to know that you can leave your house, you can travel, you can gather. Um, we just have to redesign it and do it in a really safe way. Awesome. Awesome. And I have uh, you, uh, in the chat box and, and Ernest typed in the chat box. He cannot, does not have the sound, but you can type. He say, what is the high point of your career? And oh, wow. what did you learn from the low point in sales? Wow, Ernest, I knew you hit me with a zinger. That's a great question. Um, wow, high point in sales. I mean, I think launching a book, <laughs> that's a pretty big high point, um, but we'll put that aside. I think that's the obvious, right? Um, I feel like I have a high point all the time. I, I think when a, a customer that I've been trying to work with for a long time finally comes back to me and says, hey, I'll give you a shot. That feels so good. That's so rewarding. And that's happened so many times where I will call someone and call someone and call someone and I won't leave a message. I'll just call. And finally, after the 13th try, they'll pick up the phone and they'll say, <laughs> yes, because they recognize my number and they're annoyed. And then we have a conversation about what's happening in their world and how I can help them and truly be an educator and be a listener to what's going on in their world and then solving their problem. I think that's the high point and that happens all the time. Um, but you know, the highest of the high points I think is launching a sales book. Um, the other highest of the high points is when my book came, became available for pre-order on August 20th and I became an Amazon bestseller in all five categories within 12 hours of my book being listed. That was super high. Um, so I gave you three, I hope that's okay. Um, I think the lowest, I've had a couple low points in sales. Um, I think one of the low points was definitely um, during the auto crisis in 2008. Um, I think they called it the Great Recession. When, you know, businesses were just canceling meetings and I, I just will never forget, you know, my phone ringing, not wanting to answer the phone because I knew it was another cancellation. And um, we were a week before a really beautiful um, Cisco, the technology company. We were doing an amazing women's leadership conference. And um, Cisco is very committed to establishing and building women leaders. And they just pulled out all the stops. They invested money in beautiful speakers and invested a lot of time and care into really how that meeting went. 
And the client called me about a week before and said, we have to cancel. And I had to charge them. And you know, I think the cancellation fee was a hundred thousand dollars. And it was something we had to do because we had already staffed for it, ordered all the food. And it, it was, it was a double gut punch because I know how important that meeting would have been, how many people's careers that lives would have changed because of it. Um, but I also hated to have to charge them, but it was, they're in business and we're in business and they understood it. So that was, that was a low point um, of my career. And I think, um, you know, all the low points, all the low points always end with a high point in some way. So I think COVID was really, really hard. You know, for me, I'm uh, all commission. So I only get paid when a contract happens. And so obviously, since we were moving all these contracts to the future from 2020 to future years, I worked for the most part of 2020 for free. And so just really trying to stay positive and knowing that by giving the clients what they needed at that time, which was they didn't know how to get out of these meetings, they didn't know how to move these contracts. By giving them that, I knew I was going to be establishing a good relationship and a deeper loyalty with my customers as we come out of it. And that's exactly what ended up happening. I did not lose one customer. I fired a couple uh, that, you know, they weren't good for me and I wasn't good for them. Um, but I think the lowest point of COVID, you know, ended up being the highest point of the year after because it, I was able to show my loyalty. And, and you know, I'm a, I'm a bit of a saver. And so... Um, COVID didn't hit me as hard financially as it did other people, but I will say the uncertainty of not knowing when another meeting was going to get booked, which means not knowing when my next paycheck was going to come in, that, that was really, really difficult. And so I had to have a lot of talks with myself about this is just temporary. This will change. Just stay the course, keep your head down, keep doing the work. And, um, and so that was a, that was a low point. Okay. How did you answer Ernest's question? Yeah. Joanne has a question. Joanne, would you like to ask yourself or do you want me to ask? Joanne, go ahead. I had to unmute myself. Okay, so I want to know, man. Hi, first of all, how you doing? I'm enjoying everything. Okay. Oh, how are you doing? Doing? Okay. I want to know if a person has never sold anything, you know, be it uh uh, material things or uh, like you were saying, like uh, hospitality or whatever it could be. How do you get that person to get over their fear of being a salesman, a uh, saleswoman or salesman, whatever? That is a great question. And this is something I am so passionate about. So I'm so happy you asked. Thank you, Joanne. Um, I think the big thing is just forget about the word sales. Really? Because a good salesperson is an educator and a listener. So if you were to be having a conversation with somebody that wants to, you know, that, that you want to provoke them to, to sell something, you can just let them know, you know what? You're an educator. You probably know a lot about that particular thing. Just educate me on it. Tell me what I don't know about it and see if you can solve my problem. And, and I think that's the big thing is helping people really understand that when you're offering somebody an idea or a widget or a product or a website or whatever that is, it doesn't have to feel yucky. You can really truly just listen, ask the questions and solve somebody's problem. And guess what? You might be helping them. How does that help, Joanne? I had to unmute again. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for asking. Thanks for engaging. Anybody else have any questions? Please ask. Um, in the meantime, let me ask another question. So, um, Mandy, a lot of times, many of us, we just like what Joanne said, people have never sell anything. They they have fear of selling. But mm -hmm. a lot of times we have fear of being rejected mm -hmm. when you try to sell something and they don't want it. And we all don't have six things. We thought that being reject, rejected 
feel really depressed or whatever, how do you keep on selling after all these rejections? You must have great self um, confidence or, or, you know, positive energy to keep you going. I do. Yeah, I've got like Tasmanian devil kind of energy, like a whirling dervish type energy. But um, I, I think the rejection is just a part of it. And I think you really have to accept that, right? You bring that in. So as much as you want somebody to say yes, there's going to be a whole bunch of no's before you hear a yes. And I look at a no as like food, like, let me sink my teeth into that. Tell me why you said no, because every single no is just one step closer to a yes. So I'm not afraid of the no's. And a lot of times the rejection, it has nothing to do with me, right? So when you think about being rejected, just release yourself of that and say, you know what, this probably has nothing to do with me. I'll call them later on find out. This probably doesn't work for this person at this time for some reason, or the stars and the moon aren't aligned, or, you know, the rejection doesn't have anything to do with the seller a lot of times. It has to do with all these external reasons. And so if you just accept, you're going to have rejection and you just know that give me a rejection because that means I'm one step closer to a yes. Um, That's one piece. And then I also think we can learn. I learn from every single no. And every single no, I try and figure out why did that person say no? And what can I, what good can I come of it? And what can I develop for myself in the future from that no and try and turn it into a yes. But even when people say no to me, I, I don't let them go. I still stay in touch. If somebody goes to a competitor with something, I'm still following up, you know, hey, Last time we chatted, you had picked another vendor. I'm so happy for you. I'm happy you found somebody that suits your needs. If anything changes, let me know. Or if you have any questions along the way, let me know. I'm happy to serve as an advisor. So, you know, I try and keep in touch with my nose as well because you never know something's going to happen with that person. You just never know. And I would say I've had so many customers come back to me that have said no initially And it didn't work out with the vendor that they picked and they came back and then they're more loyal than ever before. Excuse me. Can you um, send the link for your YouTube to Wan Ying's email and she can email all of us, please? Yeah. Do you want me to um, do you want me to put it in um, the chat? You want me to send it? I can can send it to you via email after the call. Okay. thank Um, you. Is that, is that good? Thank you. Yeah, that sounds good. Or we can send in the chat box and people can uh, link it too. Yeah, and you can actually, I'll, I'll do it on my website. If you go to my, I'll put that in the chat box. If you, um, on my website has all my social media handles on there too. So I'll do, I'll do a couple links in here for you. Just sending them right now. I think so. it looks like in the chat that somebody had a question about um, nonprofits, right? What nonprofits do I work with? Yes, yes. Ernest sent a a question, say what nonprofits have you worked with? So I worked with a bunch of nonprofits. Okay, I just sent a bunch of links in the chat and I'll send these to you after um, as well, but I, they're all in the chat right now. So nonprofits, so um, Junior Achievement, I volunteer in the classroom and um, uh, teach finance and um, sales. You know, the kids, sometimes they do a marketing project where they have to develop a product and then they have to sell it to their peers and they have to do a strategy. So I've done that in classrooms before. And then um, I also volunteer for the San Diego Bike Coalition. I'm really passionate about that because that's the organization that helps improve the bikeways and things in San Diego. And I'm a really big I used to be a bike commuter where I only rode my bike to work. Um, mm. I can't do that now because I work from home. But um you know, in the in the early 2000s to the to the mid 2000s, I actually only rode my bike everywhere. So San Diego Bike Coalition is really important to me. Um, in the past, I did the three day breast cancer walk. So um, the 60 mile 
breast cancer walk. Breast cancer is important to me. I have a lot of friends and family who are breast cancer survivors. Um, and then my niece is an allergy kid. So the um, F-A-R-E uh, is the allergy uh, organization and they help educate people on life-threatening allergies. Um, so, you know, whenever we can donate to that, we can. Their, their motto is teal pumpkin. So for Halloween, we always have a teal pumpkin out front, which shows kids that walk past that we're not handing out food or candy. We're actually handing out toys um, because so it's an allergy safe type thing. So those are the charities that are really important to me. And then over the years, I've worked with a ton of different charities, um, you know, on a bunch of different events. So does that help answer the question? Oh, and I see Ernest asked another question. How can we make networking easy? <laughs> um, networking really, it, it, it doesn't have to be transactional. Um, and, and networking really is just, how do I find something in common with this other person, right? So you could just ask that question, what made you laugh today? And, and that in, instantly disarms the situation. Um, I used to be that really, really annoying business person in my early 20s that I was just handing out cards like candy and collecting cards. And that that person is annoying, right? We don't like that person. I didn't like myself either, but I didn't know any better. I had to learn the hard way when I get like sneers from people. Um, so I think really just looking at networking is not being transactional, just knowing that you're planting a seed for the future. Um, one of my friends uh, who actually contributed to the book, he tells a great story. He, he tells a sales tale about one of the absolute best business associates that he still has. <laughs> An introduction that I had made many years ago to him. And it was, I knew this guy and then I had a new boss and there was just something about their vibe that I said, I just feel like they should know each other. I have no idea, you know, if they'll connect on business or be friends for life or what have you, but I just felt like they should know each other. So I just introduced the two of them. And now 20 years later, they're business partners and they're doing some really good work in the, you know, in the hospitality and the hotel community. And um, so I think, you know, making networking easy is really just taking it lightly and just knowing, you know, it's just all about getting to know somebody. I, I used to do this thing when I was single in my single years, people used to say, oh, I hate dating, um, but I loved dating. I looked at it as a chance to learn something new. And even if the date was going bad, you know, maybe I learned something about a new bottle of wine or about how to play croquet or, you know, a new movie to watch. So, you know, I think when you're doing networking, just look at it as an opportunity to learn or an opportunity to meet somebody new and have a new experience with somebody. Andy, let me ask this question. So you said you got a launch that's coming out with Thursday for your new book, right? Tomorrow, tomorrow, yeah. Tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. So give us an example of how you're going to uh, sell that book. Well, that is a great, great question. So right now, the book is listed on Amazon, online, Target online, Barnes and Noble online. I think it's on Goodreads. Um, that was supposed to be loaded up there last last week, but it's available in ebook, paperback, and hardcover. And so, I, what I've been doing is building up. So I've been using social media channels. So if you follow me on Instagram, I've been building up to the launch uh, with different posts, and not just posts that say "Buy my book." Like I've really been giving people behind the scenes looks at what it looked like to create the book, what it looked like, what it means for my family as a fourth generation writer to actually publish a book and what my house looks like right now. It's a bit of a disaster because I've got stuff for a launch party everywhere. So I've really been sharing behind the scenes because I don't think people want to see the book in their face all the time. I think they want to feel what it feels like to go through this process. So I've been trying to be really transparent with posting things on Instagram and Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, but I've also been doing things like this and just really talking with people about the 
the business of books and the process of books and, you know, getting, allowing people in looking into my world to see, you know, what that looks like. My mom made a beautiful video um, on, I have a Sales Tales YouTube channel too. I'll put that in the chat. Um, And it's a long one. It's two minutes. So just bear with her. But it's a beautiful, for any parents out there, it is a beautiful video. And I asked her, I'm like, mom, will you just make a video? Like what it means to you that I wrote a book. Assuming she'd just do a couple one-liners. She's really funny. But she recorded a two minute video about how she remembers writing when she was a kid and that my grandpa um, was a writer. And I I knew that because I read his poems um, as I was a kid. But she wrote, you know, his aunt was a writer and he was a writer and my mom's a writer and nothing ever got published. And how this means so much to our family that four generations later, we're, we're publishing a book. And she also talks about how when I was a little girl, I was, you know, two or three years old and I was modeling her. She was, uh, we were in the kitchen and I was copying her. And she said that I was walking around with a dish rag, wiping things off. And my mom said, that's fine. You know, being, you know, being a stay at home mom, that's a part of my life. But it's not all that I am. I there's so much more to me, and I want my daughter to model all that I am, not just some of what I am. And so the next day, she enrolled in a creative writing class, and she started writing. And then I remember being a little girl watching my mom type on the typewriter and sending articles into Family Circle and the different magazines. And I remember those thin rejection letters, those thin envelopes that would come in the mail. I remember every single story and every single rejection. So that really fueled me during this writing process where I thought, you know what, I'm going to put everything I have into this because I know my mom tried to do this and I want to do this for our family. And so as a result, I dedicated the book to my mom and my grandpa and, um, and my mom's video is on the YouTube channel too. So Part of selling the book for me was really just sharing the background, why the book came to life, what it takes to write a book, and then, you know, posting a bunch of stuff on, you know, all the, all the social media channels and then doing events like this. So part of selling the book is then getting out into the public and interacting with people, whether it's virtually or face-to-face, you know, after the launch party tomorrow, I have a book signing at Warwick's, which is, a 125 year old independent bookstore in La Jolla, California. It's the oldest independent bookstore in the country. And some people that have written, you know, been there, um, you know, somebody said Margaret Thatcher was there a long time ago. I don't know. I, that's what they say. I didn't fact check it. Um, Hillary Clinton, Adam Schiff, all these different people have been there over the years. And then I'm going to be an author of the week this Sunday there from 12 to two, just sitting there signing books. Um, my, spin studio we're going to do a a sweat working spin ride where we do a spin ride for 45 minutes and then after we talk about being an entrepreneur we're doing it intentionally on november 16th which is national entrepreneurs day and we're going to do pitches so it's going to be a pitch fest we're going to be sweaty we're going to have some tacos and tequila and we're going to do a pitch fest and that pitch fest is going to be we each get 30 seconds for our pitch. It can be my personal brand. It can be a pitch to why I want concrete countertops or why my husband should say yes to that. Um, We're all just going to do pitches and we're going to give each other feedback. So there's all these different types of events that I'm participating in um, as an effort to sell the book too. How does that help? I think Joanne, that was your question. I did ask it. Thank you. And so your Instagram is Mandy and your last name? Yes, it's uh, Mandy with an I underscore Graziano. Yep. All right. Thank you. Yeah, really, if you Google Mandy Graziano sales tales, you're going to find all my social handles. You're going to find all sorts of ways to track me down. Thank you. Thank you. Elnora, do you have any questions? Oh, hello. Yeah, I was trying to get a break to get in there because I was curious. Thank you so much. I'm enjoying it. Like Joanne was saying, we're really enjoying having you. You're such a 
burst of energy. But uh, what I wanted to know is, even if it's subtle, do you think there are differences in your approach and maybe even your clothes to men and women? Yes, I do. Um, that's, a, that's an important question. And that's something I've really paid a lot of attention to over the years. In fact, there's a chapter in the book um, that's called uh, Don't Be a Vanna and the Power and the Privilege of Presentation. Now, don't get me wrong. I love Vanna White. I actually met her when I was in high school. She is awesome. But the premise is, you know, she, she turns letters, right? So don't just turn the letters. If you have an opportunity to make a presentation, whether that's something like this or running a meeting or doing a resume or, you know, making a pitch, you really have to think through what that looks like, right? So, you know, as a woman, who is your audience? What are you going to wear? You know, for me, so for example, for today, I know that being on a screen can be lame for a bunch of people. So I wore an intentionally colorful shirt because I wanted you to think that I'm bright and fun and happy, which I am. But if I wore black or if I wore something white, just solid color, you might, it might take you a while to resonate with that but I really wanted my colors to match my personality. And so that's why I wore this today. So I really believe in the power of visual presentation. Um, a friend of mine was just, her name's Lisa Zone. Um, and you can look her up. Uh, she's, got, she's got a really fun Twitter and Instagram account too. But she was just interviewed on a podcast and she talks a lot about the power of presentation. And when we do these virtual calls, Sometimes people wear bracelets and the clunky, clunky bracelets make noise and it gets in the way of the interaction. Sometimes people don't look at you in the camera and it makes you feel like people aren't listening. Mm -hmm. um, and how when people are off camera, which is totally fine, but when people are off camera, it can send a message to the speaker that you know, not many people are interacting. So it really changes the speaker's tone. So that doesn't affect me because I, I do this all day, every day. But yes, um, I think the visual, how you present yourself visually is really important. A, a great example is when I first started my hotel career, I bite my nails and one of my mentors pulled me aside and she said, hey, in a business setting, people would consider unkept nails as unprofessional. Can we go to the nail salon? And you know what? I was so grateful to her because I had never, no one had ever, I, I grew up kind of a country bumpkin. I'd never really worn makeup. I never carried a purse or jewelry. I was in, and no one had ever taught me about nails or going to get a manicure or anything. So I was really grateful that she said that to me because that is, you know, the way somebody's nails look can, can be the difference between how somebody judges you or doesn't judge you. And you really only have 20 seconds to make an impression. Um, I, I also, from a presentation standpoint, you know, I, I like to know who's in the audience. Is it men, women? What are, what are their ages? What are their backgrounds? Because I'm going to tailor my presentation to that. So yeah, the visual presentation is everything and really knowing who the audience is, is very important to men, men and women. Yep. Right. So now uh, you got me about 80% there as to where, and I'm going to go in for that other 20%, if you oh, don't mind. Yeah, <laughs> let's hear it. I love okay, it. Okay, okay. So what I was really trying to get at is when you're trying to sell a male, mm -hmm. let's say it's one-on-one -on -one or a few males in the audience or whatever, and when you're trying to sell a female group, what is the difference in the way you present yourself to those two genders? Oh, or is okay. there a difference? Yeah, well, yes and no. I think prior to five years ago, I had a much different approach to the gender self. I think now I've learned a lot about who I'm presenting to. And it's not necessarily if it's a male or a female, it's all about what their situation is, right? So for example, I will talk to a C-level person in a much different way than I'll talk to a director or a manager level person and a much different way I'll talk to a support person. All people are important because they're all parts of the team. 
But I know that C-level people are really, really interested in the bottom line, growing the business and what the financial impact and perception of their business is, right? And I know the manager and director level are really, really interested in processes and logistics and things. And I know the support level, they're really interested in how they can grow in their job and how I can make them look good. But they're also interested in getting answers quickly and being able to translate answers for their bosses. So um, I think prior to five years ago, I might have flirted a little bit with men or women, depending on what I think their situation is. Not in an inappropriate way, but in, you know, I might just be a little bit, if I feel like the vibe is fun and in um, cool, then I would take that vibe. But if I feel like the vibe is serious, then I would be very facts-based and numbers-based and everything. So um, that's, that's how I was, I would say before five years ago, but now I really focus on the nature of that person and what I think they might be interested in. It doesn't matter if they're a man or a woman at this point. Does that help? And that's yeah. really evolved. And the older I get, too, the more um, the more I evolve, too. Because I remember when I, I'm from Ohio, and I've been in San Diego 21 years. And before I ever moved to California, I was pretty buttoned up. Like, I, I would never wear a V-neck shirt that's, like, close to my breast line <laughs> before I moved to California. And I would never wear spaghetti straps or open-toed shoes or anything. Um, and that's because, you know, I grew up Catholic in Ohio, where I grew up was pretty conservative. And no one was telling me what to do. I was just sort of modeling the people that were around me. But when I came out to California, it's just hotter here, you know, I mean, and we're outside. So my clothes just naturally changed. And I had to really go through that, you know, what I have to cover up, I have to and, and I, I'm full disclosure, I am an ample bosomed girl. And I always have been since I was a little girl. So I've always had to be conscious of how I'm representing myself in that way. Is it is it too low? If I'm sitting at a business lunch, if someone stands up, can they see that? So I'm very, very conscious of that, even, even early on in my career. Um, but I, I'm not as concerned about that now moving forward in the last five years. I'm very focused on, do I look professional? Am I speaking professionally? And am I resonating with the people in the audience? So that's a very, very long question, but I, I wanted to give all the answers to it. Okay, thank you. Does that help? Yes. Okay, good. I think that was a wonderful, excellent question and, and, and a wonderful, excellent um, answer to this question. Yeah, great question. I keep them coming. I love that. I have one more. Um, so, you talk about the lessons that you 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 learn from your years in the business. Yeah. So can you tell us what are the things that you can advise us not to do? What are the deal breakers? What are the um, uh, what things that can help us not to do in order to close your deals? Well, um, I think closing a deal is really easy when you've done all the work on the front end. Um, but something that people don't do is they don't ask for the business. They do all this work <laughs> and they get to the end and they're afraid to say, can we work together? Can you be on this podcast? Can you give me money for my fundraiser? People are afraid to go in and ask that question. So go in and ask the question. Um, don't be afraid to ask the question. The worst thing somebody's going to say is no, but remember that no gets you closer to a yes. Um, and I think another thing is um, don't talk too much. You know, try and listen. Um, silence is power a lot of times. And I think people have a lot to say. So, you know, don't go into a situation where you're starting to talk and you're not giving somebody the chance to ask questions or listen. Um, just, just be a good listener. Um, and I think, you know, making people feel like you're just out for the, the piece of business or you're just out for that. I, I think not following up is a big deal. So just make, continue to follow up, but making people feel yucky, you know, just, you don't want to do that. Just truly be interested. And the other thing is don't take a job that you don't like. You know, I talk about this in the book. One of my big lessons was my very first sales job. Well, my second sales job was for a printing company where we just produced, you know, training manuals. 
I didn't understand it. I didn't like it. I, I was embarrassed to do it. And so I was bad at it and I got fired from that job and I should have been fired. I was a really bad salesperson because I didn't believe in the product. So don't take a job that you don't believe in. And if you have to sell it, right, don't sell a product that you don't believe in. Now, some of us, we have to take jobs. Like at that point, I had just graduated college. I needed that job. And so I stayed in that job until they fired me. And then the gift that they gave me was to fire me so I could find a job that I loved. Um, But, you know, just try and find a product that you love and sell that. And then, um, you know, I, I just think being a good listener, you know, don't, uh, don't sell a product you don't want. And Oh, the other thing, another big lesson from the book is don't work with a customer that gives you stomach pains and makes you wake up in the middle of night thinking about their business. There is no customer in the world that is worth that. So get rid of that person. And you'll realize that you have way more time in your day to focus on the good customers and potentially new customers to help move your life and your business forward. Awesome, awesome. Anybody else have any questions for Mandy? And I can- Yeah, another question occurred to me, uh, Mandy, is, and I've always wanted to ask this and I never had an opportunity to ask someone that was technically competent in this area, I guess. And that is, Do you think that the customer buys initially the salesperson or the product? You're speaking my language, Elnora. (laughs) Yeah, I think I think people buy from people they trust or a product they trust. And I think there's a lot you have to do to build that trust. I do not subscribe to the uh, story of people buy from people they like, because you can like people, but you don't trust them. Um, And you can trust people, but you don't have to like them. Um, So I I think, you know, in my experience, I've sold all sorts of different services, hotels, products, things over the years, but I've collected all those people and they're, they're sticking with me, right? And I'll do the same. I'm a buyer in my current job, right? So I'll always buy from that person that I trust. It doesn't matter what product they're selling as long as I have a need for it. Um, so I'm, I'm more about the person than the product. And I'm more about the trust than the like. How, how does that help, Elnora? Yes, great. Thank you so much. Mandy, one more question, and then I guess we're going to have to go. <laughs> Wanted to wrap it up. Listen, so you know, for the young people, the millennials, I guess, and then the other ones too. In today's market, for like you know, we just we talk about sales mm-hmm. and like about your book. I went to a uh, one book author's uh talk, and they actually had their book. Uh, I mean, where it was Russell Simmons' daughter, you know, the hip hop guy, yeah. Russell Simmons. His daughter uh, had this book on a keychain. It was a little miniature book that somebody had wrote, and they put the book in a little small on a keychain. Cool. So, do you think that you could do something like that with your book? Yeah, for sure. So, was it the paper? On the keychain, or was it like a USB stick on a keychain? Uh, uh-uh, it wasn't a USB. It was actually like a little hardback miniature book. Only oh, if I can find it, I'll send it to you. If she still has it on her Instagram, I'll send it to you. To yeah, your, your I, Instagram. I would love to see it. Now, you know what? I'm open to all sorts of different ways and ideas of marketing the book. I hadn't thought about that yet. That's super interesting. Um, and, and who knows, maybe, maybe you'll see my book on a keychain. You just gave me a brilliant idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I send it to you if she still has it on Instagram. I would love to see that. Okay. I am doing, um, speaking of the different ways the book will be distributed in February, I'm going to be recording the audio book and I'm going to have a second launch when the audio book is recorded probably April or May of next year. So, you know, it's available on ebook, paperback, hardcover, and then it will be available on audio next year. 
Awesome. And uh, uh, Mandy, in this book club, we have had this book since 2011. It's almost like uh, 10 years. And over the years, we have um, we usually have one month we read a book and the other month we have author um, speaking. And um, in the last couple of years due, due to COVID, so we were having more authors than usual because uh, uh, we just don't meet in person. So we have more authors. So a lot of times uh, you can tell our um, audiences, Elnora, Joanne, and they just ask wonderful questions, don't they? Because they think questions. I love it. Yes, they're a very intelligent group of uh, uh, avid readers. So we meet, met many authors and they always think that the authors, um, when they have a book being published, they all, always have three stages of their um, process. First, they need to get the book written, writing the book. And second is get the book published. And nowadays with uh, self-publishing, it's making easy easier. And then the hard part is to get the book written and then get it published. But I think the hardest part of all these is get it marketed and sell the book. Yes. And that is the hardest part. But and the many times you can see these authors going through um, um, the hardest part and they have their agent um, to do that. But for you, you are a marketer yourself. And I see that the, what you've been talking about to sell it on Amazon, online, Target, online, Barnes & Noble, Goodreads, and all these are just wonderful, wonderful uh, channel. And you are very, very technical savvy. And nowadays it seems like it, it's even more important to sell it online on social, through social media and also book clubs like these e-book clubs around the country. So we really wish you, um, you are really a bundle of energies vibrant, colorful, and energetic. So I really think, you know, with your knowledge on sales and marketing, it's going to be really, really successful. Oh, thank you. That means so much to me. I hope it's successful. And, you know, I've had to have some talks with myself over the last couple of weeks about, it's not about being on the New York Times bestseller list. It's not about being that bestselling author. If I look back at the reason I wrote the book, it's really just to publish a book. And if my mom is the only one that buys that book, I've still accomplished my goal, right? I've, I've written it, I've published it, and I'm delivering the message that's important to me to get out into the world, which is sales is for everybody. We can do it. We can get comfortable with it. And that's really what I want. Now, you know, all the other awards, that's really nice. But I've had a, a nice little mental match with myself over the last couple of weeks about where I focus my energies. Because when you focus your energies on being bestseller of all of this, one thing happens. When you focus your energies on your original intention of the book, which is just to get the word out about sales and to share it with people that are interested in wanting to talk about it, you, you have a whole different strategy. So I've really backed up my strategy to meet my original intention. And so thank you for saying that. That means a lot to me. I really, really, really appreciate it. So, yes, we have about five minutes left, but that was wonderful. And thank you so much for um, sharing with your book and, uh, and doing this book talk to uh, with us. And this is absolutely wonderful. And we wish you all the best luck in this. And we know it's going to be very, very successful. And thank this you. Time <laughs> At the same time, I want to thank everybody else for joining us uh, in this uh, Books and Beyond uh, the, um, book club meeting. Mandy, please put out the, uh, the email to uh, one of all those links about your, about your friends, what she did that podcast. I want to hear that podcast and all of that. And uh, I think when Wang Ying mentioned to you that she recorded this and you can go to the library's website and see it. It's about I will, your mother yeah. might want to see it. Yeah. Oh, my mother will. She, I thought she would be on the call. My mother will definitely love to see this. I will send you the links to everything, including the video from my mom's backstory. And stuff. okay, I'll, thank I'll you. I'll send it all to you as soon as we hang up. All right, thank you. Awesome. That's wonderful. And uh, we will in a book club. We will meet again next week, next month on um, Tuesday, November the sixteenth, and we'll have another author um, of the book called Blinger an entrepreneur's face-based journey. Um, 
Tuesday, November the 16th. And in the meantime, check out the library's Oktoberfest on 901 Personal Finance for a series of other uh, workshops on personal finance and business. And hope all of you have a wonderful day. And thank you so much, Mandy. We thoroughly enjoyed Now, Mandy. Bye. <laughs> have a beautiful day. Thank you. You thank too. You. Bye. Thank you all. Y'all enjoy your day. Bye, Wayne. Bye-bye.